Hi, I'm Beverly Payef Macy, Director of the Macy Archive in New York City, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw mine modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Beyond lovely coffee table architecture books with thoughtful, sometimes playful, meticulously strategized photos of brilliant modernist buildings, there's a whole nother world of architectural scholarship. The core of architecture and urban planning scholarship offers large and complex design solutions for even larger and more complex social problems. It's not easy getting people to admit something is a problem, then getting an agreement on a solution, then finding the political will and money to get anything implemented. Design scholars have their own rhythmic and intense way of writing as they search to provide meaningful analysis about buildings, materials, design, planning, and social impact. All of this can be a little intimidating for the general public. Like, imagine if Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory studied architecture instead of physics. Yikes. Yet, scholars are the R&D department for innovations that may come 5, 10, or even 50 years later. Joining us today are two of the most celebrated, most wicked smart design authors, Joseph Giovannini and Kenneth Frampton. I'm so excited to have Kenneth Frampton, especially because I loved playing his records back in the 70s. You know, Baby, I Love Your Way, Do You Feel Like We Do, that Frampton Comes Alive album, everybody had a copy of that. Tom, Tom, Tom. What? That's that's Peter Frampton, yeah. not Kenneth Frampton. Oh. I don't think Kenneth plays guitar. Oh, and didn't invent that talk box thingy? Uh, Peter Frampton. Oh. Yeah. He's not on. No. <laughs> okay. He's not on today. Well, we do have music coming up from the charming Eileen Graff. And now, your host, a gentleman but not a scholar but smarter than me, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thanks, Tom. On a more serious note today... Do you remember March 2020, anyone? Mm Mm-hmm. I was in New York attending an architecture lecture the day the pandemic became official, changing from a news story to the news story. Suddenly, no one was shaking hands, and the fist bump hadn't caught on yet. So here was an auditorium full of people apologizing to each other on why they weren't shaking hands or hugging their friends like usual. We didn't know why exactly, but it was clear we were all going to infect each other with any human contact. Mm -hmm. People spread out naturally in ones and twos across the seating, with spaces in between. And that night, after the talk, I went to dinner with a prominent historian in a prominent restaurant, and we were two of only four people in the whole place. Wow. The next day, as I flew home from LaGuardia, the old one, before the new building opened, I walked down the concourse from TSA and did not see a single soul. We've come a long way since then. We've endured masks, shots, booster shots, school closings, epic misinformation, and unbelievable human suffering. Here on U.S. Marnish Radio, we celebrate architects and buildings and modernism's promise of a future so bright we got to wear shades. Coming out of the pandemic, we move towards that bright future again, and it's time to work on the hardest thing that humans have to do, individually and especially in groups to trust and act trustworthy. Amen. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs, and by modernist realtor Angela Roll. In a classic tale that we are largely making up, realtor Angela Roll trained with the Navy SEALs, the first woman to complete the grueling program. On a mission to England, she infiltrated a royal wedding, but after accidentally spilling a bottle of Chateau Margaux 1787 on someone's mother, who had a crown, her military record became classified and she was burn noticed to Prague in the Czech Republic. Angela was broke with only a 9mm Ruger, a circular saw, and a red ball gown. She studied architecture by day and built portable dance floors by night. It was on one of her dance floors at the Finnish embassy that she waltzed into the arms of international man of mystery, Eric of Helsinki, whom she later married. 
Now she's a leading modernist real estate agent with architecture training, advising to buyers and sellers of modernist houses on everything from appropriate renovation to getting your circular saw past customs. Angela Roll is your special agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or call 919-995-0550. Joseph Giovannini is a critic, author, teacher, and architect based in New York. With degrees from Yale, Harvard, and the Sorbonne, he's wicked smart. Besides heading his design practice, Giovannini Associates, a design firm based in New York and Los Angeles, Joseph has written on architecture and design for three decades for such publications as the New York Times, Architectural Record, Art in America, Art Forum, and Architecture Magazine. He served as architecture critic for New York Magazine and the Los Angeles Herald Examiner and led the years-long fight against the demolition and decentralization of the Los Angeles Contemporary Museum of Art, which is now going to be demolished and decentralized. Here's George and Joseph Giovannini. Joseph, I understand this is your first podcast interview. It is. I'm thrilled. Welcome to the world of podcasting. <laughs> I figure somebody with your experience and, and all the books you've written and all the things you've been involved in, you've been on a podcast before. No, I'm a complete virgin. <laughs> well, we're going to have to get you listening. You know, uh, there, I think something like 800,000 podcasts now, there's a lot of them on everything. I mean, if you want to know the, the history of lemons to, you know, modernist architecture, there's a show for you. And, uh, and we're really thankful that you can be on with us. Thank you. I've been encouraged to do my own, uh, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around this foreign concept. I'll, I'll eventually get there, but by the time I do, a uh, podcast will probably be on to something else. <laughs> well, I've been looking at your most impressive book at almost 900 pages. Uh, I need a workout just to read it. Well, it's designed so that you work out as you read it, so you, it's a, it's a, <laughs> you, can, multi, you can multitask. I mean, that is quite an accomplishment to put all that together. The detail is just amazing. I didn't start out thinking I'd be doing a monument, but the, there was so much material and it led to so many different places, many of them secret, that the content really drove the, um, the whole project and, and therefore the length. Well, this book is about disruption, really, about things that come from another angle and, and change the way people think about architecture. Now, I, as a layperson, think that somebody like Frank Lloyd Wright would be a disruptor, but you're really talking about a different category of people, aren't you? I am. I'm, I'm looking, uh, the disruptors that interest me are the kind of the renegades, uh, the people who think, think asymmetrically. You know, there are various avant-gardes, and my avant-garde is a particular stripe. Like what? Give me some examples. Well, you could say that the movement starts way back in the teens and 20s when there was a disruptive avant-garde, you know, Dada people and surrealists who didn't see reality in the in a way that a realist would. And so I, I would consider Frank Lloyd Wright a realist. He was a great architect and he certainly disrupted things and he broke the box. And so he was he was a great architect. But as, as Philip Johnson liked to say, and, and he'd like to say to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's face, he's a 19th century ar architect and not really a modernist. Okay, okay. So were these disruptions that were coming into architecture primarily from the art movement or within the profession itself? You know, it starts really in the 19th century with mathematicians who were looking at Euclidean geometry and thinking that there are other mathematics, there are other geometries. And so they start challenging Euclid. And that leads in many different directions. It eventually gets to Einstein and relativity. But in the meantime, uh, also there are a lot of people who are looking at dimensions other than the three dimensions. So they're, they're looking into the fourth dimension. So there's an esoteric part of it. There's a scientific part, mathematical part. All of that that impacts the art world. And so you have the uh, Cubists and the Cubofuturists and, of course, the Constructivists and all their stripes, including the Suprematists and, and the Rationalists. It's really a big soup, a sort of a stew of alternative thinking that leads out of realism into other worlds. So who is an architect from that time that would be considered a disruptor? Well, first of all, there's a painter named Malievich 
who became an architect. He was a suprematist who was interested in the fourth dimension. He did paintings that are um, very otherworldly and skipped the third dimension all the way to the fourth. He did in the 20s architectural studies. He actually built models that in, in some way transcribe his breakthroughs in painting. Somebody who was actually trained as an architect was Lizitsky, Lizitsky, who did wonderful studies in a, um, a world of impossible space in which he explored how planes and matter interpenetrated and, and created impossible space. He did this by exploring perspectival techniques. He would mix, for example, axonometric with perspective and with planes that interpenetrated so that there were a lot of transparencies. He scrambled space. He eventually realized the square root of minus one. So it was it, it was all about irrationality. He finally decided that the fourth dimension was really not possible in real space, that the fourth dimension was time. And he did propose building a lot of real buildings. But his real contribution were these wonderful drawings that were quite impossible, theoretically impossible. But uh, in my view, that's now possible to build. And Zaha Hadid was one of the people who pick, picked up on that very early experimentation and and who actually realized it. She did the first suprematist buildings that were first proposed back in the 20s. So what are some examples of Zaha Hadid buildings that use these principles? Well, first and foremost is her first building, which is the Vitra fire station, in which she kind of zooms space by building illusions. She shapes buildings that appear to stretch, that appear to accelerate because she uses forced perspective. She reverses perspective. She does a lot of perceptual tricks that um, are actually built. So whereas Lizitsky drew the tricks, she actually built them. She built illusion into form, into concrete. So that was done in the late 1980s or early 90s, I should say. Now, when you think of the modernist movement, Traditionally, you're thinking of Wright, Schindler, Neutra, maybe even throw Craig Elwood in there. How did these disruptors affect mainstream modernism as it was coming along in the 20s, 30s, and 40s? Well, they were not so interested in mechanics. The machine was not the driver of their thinking. I'd have to add in the 20s and the teens also the uh, expressionists who explored another avenue of, of design. Uh, it was not necessarily the fourth dimension, but it was organic architecture. Is this along the lines of Bruce Goff? Uh, Bruce Goff is a great eccentric. I don't think that he comes out of this tradition directly, but he's expressive perhaps without being expressionist. He doesn't really design organically, although his forms are certainly unusual. He's a great renegade. I don't know quite how to absorb him into my scheme of things, and it's not necessary. There are a lot of people who are excellent architects on their own who don't necessarily belong to the strain of the avant-garde that I'm interested in. Well, help me understand what that strain is, because I'm throwing out names here, and no one really belongs to the club so who would be an architect that I might have heard of that was part of this movement? Or was it all more academic or from the art world? Oh, there are tons of architects in many strains. The eminent Spanish architect Enrique Mirayas is uh, was brilliant. Everything he touched turned to architecture. He did a lot of buildings that are very complex, quite uh, unexpected, very articulate. Daniel Liebeskin, Zaha Hadid, Frank Gehry and a colleague of his named uh, Claude Parham from France, uh, were both inspired by artists. The art movements of the time really affected their work and, and brought them out of the classical modernist tradition. In Los Angeles, I like to think of the classical modernism, um, the contemporary modernism, centered on Wilshire Boulevard, which means that it was um, they were interested in slick buildings and Euclidean forms and chrome detailing. They were perfectionists. Frank and others were beeps in imperfection, incompletion, ways of distorting what might be considered regularity. So in essence, is this really a shift from more square geometric forms into sculpture? I mean, certainly I think of Frank Gehry buildings as being as much a sculpture as a building. Well, if, if you say that it's sculpture, it kind of 
trivializes their work in the sense that it, 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 you're saying it's not really architecture. It really is architecture in, in that they're exploring other geometries that were not sort of soared within the Euclidean framework. There's a wonderful quote from Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, in which one brother says to the other, if you're contemplating divinity, how can you understand divinity by projecting a Euclidean mindset? Um, because infinity occurs where parallel lines cross, and, and Euclid can't handle that. And so cultivating alternative ways of thinking that are in some ways strange, and they're not absorbed in our everyday, um, in the everyday right angle, in, in the grid, in, in the um, perspective. Actually, there are a lot of people who actually cultivated ways of thinking differently so that they could design differently. And there were many avenues for doing that. As I said, Claude Parhon and Frank Gehry looked to art and the various schools of art that impacted their work and started breaking down a conventional way of thinking. The title I use, avant-garde, is a kind of a catch-all term, but originally it meant that the avant-garde is the that group of soldiers that penetrate the lines of the enemy and, and break open space so that the following army can come in. And so these are people who are in some way pushing boundaries and, and breaking open new territories of exploration so the, so the rest of the field can enter. The interesting thing is to stay avant-garde has to keep on pushing into new territory so it is obligated to being perpetually inventive. Well, to extend your analogy, it would seem like the soldier that you agree with is a freedom fighter and the soldier you disagree with is a terrorist. So what is the difference between something that's avant-garde and somebody that's just a little crazy? Uh, well, somebody who's a little bit crazy doesn't necessarily break and open new territory. That could be an iconoclast, and without lessons learned, then the iconoclasm doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't mean that there's new territory that other people can occupy. It's sort of dead-ended. And so a terrorist is a destroyer. That's very different than a disruptor. Okay. Who are some of the avant-garde in our era? Oh, I would say that a lot of the people who were in the avant-garde in the 80s and 90s are still practicing. Frank Gehry is now 92, and he's still doing original work. Peter Eisman as well. There's a younger crop, however, Thomas Lesser, who practices in New York and who used to work with Peter Eisman. He's a very interesting architect. Certainly, there are the digital architects, including Greg Lynn in California, who start out very much influenced by the disruptors identified from the 1980s and who are doing their own forms of disruption. So there, there are quite a few. It's become, um, without being rigid, a school of thought, let's say a school of freedom, where architects have learned to kind of pursue their bliss into new territories that open up space for other architects. The architects that are becoming very well known, for instance, are they disruptors themselves or are they pulling on just some of these earlier traditions to make more buildings? I'm thinking particularly of Bjarke Ingels, who has done some very innovative projects around the world. Um, you know, there are some architects who've done very innovative projects, and Ingels, I believe, comes out of the Rem Koolhaas tradition. And I'm sort of a suspect of that group because their technique is to uh, kind of throw a lot of stuff at the walls and see what sticks. So they would have jam sessions and uh, explore maybe 12 or 14 parties that are kind of unusual but it's not actually a methodology that's translatable or transmittable to other people. It's, it's just, you know, whatever is original is striking or, you know, it's not, I'm not so interested in people who don't design from a body of thought who are more or less simply operational. I have a lot of respect for buildings they've done. One of his buildings is in my book, actually. It's on the Hudson River, and they use high bar services. It looks warped because it is warped, um, and so it is non-Euclidean, but it, they get there sort of by accident. Is that the Via 57 building? Yes, that's right. So how does it get there by accident? Help me understand that. Well, they had a great river view along the Hudson. They had a program and a site. And what they did was study all the morphologies possible on that site, whether it was a courtyard or a tower or a platform. 
and uh, they basically hybridized that building from the typologies that were feasible. Um, and so they created a building that has there's a courtyard building, but with its profile on the slope that maximizes the number of views to the river. So it was kind of an operational strategy. It wasn't done from a design philosophy. It was very pragmatic. And I think there's a, certainly a place for pragmatics. Not, no building can be built without being pragmatic. But it wasn't a method of designing. It was a, as I say, accidental or fortuitous, I'd say. I liked the building a lot. And I'm glad that they got there and it was very effective. So I'm not criticizing the building. I'm saying that that methodology is not really transmittable. Well, can you give me an example of a building that comes from a solid design methodology that is transmittable? Because I look at VF57 and think that not only is it pragmatic, but it seems to to really flow to the layperson, but understand that you're going a lot deeper than that. So give me an example of a building that does flow from this design philosophy that you speak of. Well, I suppose some of Zaha Hadid's buildings are good examples of that because she not only breaks down the, the box, but she three-dimensionalizes the plan so that you have a entirely three-dimensionalized way of looking at a building. So as a result, the space flows, the form flows, is highly plastic. And then there's the artistic component because if you overlay distortions and illusions onto that, you get a very interesting building. So would Saarinen's TWA terminal at JFK be an example of this same kind of thing? Because I see that as this idea of a very three-dimensional building. Yes, he was interested in fluidity and he was dealing with concrete and also the metaphor of flight. So he was at ease in the curvilinear world, unlike his colleague, um, Charles Eames, with whom he did a lot of furniture. When, when they, they did their furniture competition submitted to the MoMA in the 40s, it was Charles who did the orthogonal cabinetry, but Sarnin who did the fluid stuff. I've written a lot about this. He was at home in the curvilinear world. Not everybody is. You know, Zaha, for example, picked up the French curve after decades that it had been left in disuse, the French curve was last seen in the Beaux-Arts design studios. And that was more or less left aside when the design was mechanized in order to conform to architecture that's predicated on a mechanical paradigm. And so she did a lot of her stuff. She was a great draftswoman, and she learned from a very early age because her mother was an artist to draw. So she, she trusted her hand and the freedoms of the hand and the free forms. And so you might say that her design is very humanist because it comes from the drawing, comes from the hand, not from a triangle or a T-square or a parallel rule. The book is Architecture Unbound, A Century of the Disruptive Avant-Garde, Transgressive, Oblique, Aberrant, Deconstructed, Digital. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, thank you, George. That was George Smart and Joseph Giovannini. Kenneth Frampton is a much-awarded British architect, critic, and historian. After teaching at Princeton, he's been on Columbia University's faculty since 1972, where he is the Ware Professor of Architecture. Kenneth is especially well-known for his articles and books on modernist architecture and the economic, social, and psychological impact modernism has on people and groups. His many books include the classic Modern Architecture, A Critical History, and his latest, The Other Modern Movement. Last year, a certain English woman in her 90s with a crown honored him as a commander of the Order of the British Empire. And now, Kenneth Frampton, in his very first appearance on a podcast, talking with George Smart. I'll start with this question. Let's go back in time to 1960. Now, today, you're one of the foremost authorities on modern architecture, but when you were coming up, In 1960, who were you listening to? Who were you reading at that time? Well, it begins a bit earlier because I started to study in 1950 in the A School of Architecture in London and uh, reading, well, Lewis Mumford, Techniques and Civilization, Siegfried Gideon, Space, Time and Architecture, J.M. Richards, British uh, critic, editor of the Architectural Review, a small little penguin book called Modern Architecture, Yes, those were the kinds of books I was reading at that time. And, of course, Le Corbusier's Towards the New Architecture, which had been translated into English in 1929 with a mistranslation because 
the original French title was Towards an Architecture, and uh, the British changed it. Oh, they did. Those naughty British. Yeah, right. Well, you know, they qualified it because they were too shocked by uh, the fact that it could be an architecture. You know, yeah. Right, right. Mm. And who were some of the, the critics of that time? Was Colin Rowe active then? He was beginning to be. I've forgotten now the date of uh, the famous essay, you know, Mathematics of the Ideal Villa. But that was a sort of um, game-changing essay of, of extreme brilliant perception, which changed, of course, the view of... Uh, Le Corbusier, because um, it's a reading of Le Corbusier in terms of Palladio, you know, and it's very convincing. So uh, he was rising, and J.M. Richards, of course, was a critic at that time in the British scene anyway. Vincent Scully was beginning to be active as a critic here in the States. Of course, Henry Russell Hitchcock was very active as a kind of critic historian, both in the States and in the U.K., He was the one that was involved in Philip Johnson with the MoMA show, right? The famous MoMA show? Yeah, right, 1932. Tell our listeners about that show and why that was so important. Well, it was important because it puts the so-called white architecture on the map, you know. Um, It posits the idea of an international style. But the big ideological distortion or manipulation was the fact that for Hitchcock and Johnson, the international style was a style, and that is, that is to say, exclusively an aesthetic. Whereas many of the international architects, particularly, of course, European ones, but uh, also even in the States, in California, you know, there was a kind of ideological issue. You know, there was a programmatic agenda which um, made it more, well, uh, more profound than simply being an aesthetic. It was a way of living. Is it like that? Uh, yeah, it's a way of living. It's also a concept of the society. I mean, the, the first building in the book, this um, the other modern movement, is Schindler's uh, King's Road House, which he started in 1922. And that house in itself, you know, involved another way of life, uh, actually in, in a very quiet, small way, a more collective way of life, because there was a common kitchen. There was two families living in that house, Clive Chase and his wife, and also um, um, Schindler and Pauline Schindler. The women shared the preparation of food, so each evening a different wife would make the meal that was shared then by the four of them. I mean, this, I think, was you know some kind of ideal which went on for quite a while until the Chase family left. And, and didn't the Neutras live with the Schindlers for a while? They did. They did. They did. They followed, in fact. They followed, you know, with their young son. Yes, correct. And Pauline Schindler, nay, Gibling, I met her, you know, in the mid-60s in California, in L.A., and she was a a political radical as well as she was a leftist, without a doubt, right to the end of her life, actually. I've read in numerous accounts that architects who were advocating modernism and who were more to the left were treated as suspect by the FBI and, and other organizations because they were too far left. Gregory Ain, for example had an FBI file for years. I I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised. Yes. Yeah. Well, this still goes on to some extent. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the era of McCarthyism had not yet arrived, but it soon would arrive, and uh, it's not exactly entirely dead either, but there we are, yes. During the 50s, was Frank Lloyd Wright as big a deal as the, the history books tell us he was? I mean, was he as larger in life on the architecture scene as he seemed to be? That's, a, that's an interesting issue. I mean, of course, the Southern California school, Neutra, Schindler, and the subsequent, Gregory Hayne and even Hamilton Harwell Harris, were all, to some extent, influenced by Wright. So certainly the, the school of Southern California was influenced by Wright. In the East Coast, this is less clear, I would say. I mean, the, the uh, influence by Wright on the East Coast is much, much weaker. So despite falling water, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, I think... The influence of Wright was much weaker on the East Coast. The influence of Wright was very strong in Italy because of Bruno Zerbi, who spent the war years in the United States but came back to Italy and started a movement in Italy vis-à-vis an organic architecture following the use of that term by Wright. And so um, there was a certain following in Italy of Wright. I would say more than anywhere else in Europe, as a matter of fact. There's a figure whose name was Leonardo Ricci, who was very kind of neo-Wrightian in 
Italy at the time. And did you get to meet Wright at all? No, I missed meeting Wright because Wright was in the AA school in 49. I missed him. And by the time I came to the States, 65, he was already deceased, I think, if I remember correctly. Yes. Just. But I met the others. Of course, I met Le Corbusier. One of the things that, that I like about your book is that you have told some of the stories of people that don't get told very often. I'm reminded of uh, books of rock and roll where they will talk about the musicians that played with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones that were equally as talented in many ways, but not nearly as famous. Yeah. And you have taken that route here with some of these names. A couple I wanted to ask you about in particular. Tell us about Eileen Gray. Yes, Eileen Gray is very interesting. Born into a kind of Anglo-Irish family, somewhat aristocratic, went to London as a young woman to study painting, but ended up working for a Japanese lacquerist in London, and then moved to Paris and continued to work in lacquer. She was at first a designer of furniture and of interiors for the Parisian sophisticated upper middle class, and many lacquer screens by her. She opened a store in Paris with selling her stuff. And then she met Jean Badovici, a Romanian immigre who was given a big break by Auguste Perret because they started in 1923 a journal called La Cité Vivante, of which Badovici, Jean Badovici, was the uh, editor. We never know exactly what kind of a relationship existed between Eileen Gray and Jean Badovici. I mean, Eileen Gray was sort of ambisextrous, as they say, and... Uh, so they may have been lovers at some point. In any case, it's uh, Jean Benevici who encouraged her to enter into architecture. She had personal wealth, so she built this house in Cap Martin in the south of France. It was finished around uh, 29. And she actually would give this house as a present to Benevici and then built herself another house higher up, slightly further away from the sea, which she kept for herself until the end of her life, basically. She lived to a great age. This house has recently been restored, the E1027. That's very fascinating, you know, because E is the, um, it stands for Eileen, of course, and seven at the end is the seventh letter of the alphabet, gray. And then um, 10 is for Jean, the 10th letter of the alphabet, and the B is the second letter of the alphabet. So they made it, they gave the house a name, which was like a registration number, for an aircraft, you know, E-1027. But actually, it's a kind of story about their relationship in a way. Eileen Gray kind of protecting Jean Benevici, you could say. Eileen Gray really didn't get much coverage in the press or the media during her lifetime, did she? Towards the end of her life, she lived to a great age. I think she was 93 or something, 94 when she died. So towards the last 10 years of her life, she was rediscovered, basically, partly through a British critic, Joseph Rickworth, partly through somebody named Peter Adam, who was a, a German sort of broadcaster, filmmaker, critic who lived in London. Her cousin, I think, Prunella Clough, was living in London, painter, still alive, uh, very much so, slightly younger. And through her, the British rediscovers her, basically, yes. Is there any American counterpart of Eileen Gray, a, a woman who was under the radar and got rediscovered late in her career? Uh, no, I don't think so. There are, uh, of course, women architects. And as I said of the book, unfortunately, it does have a kind of very Eurocentric side to it. And I have to confess there is no uh, woman architect uh, no American woman architect present in this anthology, but uh, have been very uh, talented women architects, but um, perhaps none with the, the kind of very categoric achievement of Gray's house. I mean, that house in the south of France, well, these two houses in the south of France, are they represent the core of her work, of course. Are they both still there? Yeah, they are, yes, yes. yes. I know one was restored recently. Yes, the E-1027 was very recently restored, very well, finally, yes. After a long time. Yeah, after a long time and a lot of vandalism in between, yeah. Now, was that near the place where uh, Le Corbusier dove into the sea and killed himself? Exactly, it's the same place. It's Cap Martin 
you know, what Le Corbusier had a little cabin all there, you know, at the last 10 years of his life was his own vacation house by the sea. During the 30s, he actually stayed in the house which then belonged to Badovici, E1027. But at some point, he built his own house. In 1952, he built his own little cabin on, absolutely minute. There was a restaurant next door. In fact, the cabin on was directly connected to the restaurant called L'Etoile de Mer. This restaurant also commissioned Le Corbusier to design some holiday houses, five holiday houses called camping houses that exist on the site. So the site is a kind of, um, you might say, a kind of bohemian vacation place from 1929 when the first house is finished until uh, Le Corbusier's death in 1965. Okay. Now, you've written so extensively about modernism from so many different angles. Yeah. One of my questions is, what happened in the 70s? It seemed like modernism was doing great, And then all of a sudden it's out of favor and the postmodernists come in all complaining. What was going on? Yeah, well, it's it's somewhat difficult to fully explain. In any case, you know, there is this French philosopher, Jean-Francois Lyotard, who publishes in 1977 a philosophical text called The Postmodern Condition, which gets translated into English two years later. I mean, on the state side, of course, It is Robert Venturi's uh, Complexity and Contradiction of, I believe, 1961, published by the Museum of Art, you know, against a rational, white, functional building. Venturi had been influenced to some extent by Alto, maybe, and by Sharoon, and had been influenced, I think it's fair to say, by Louis Kahn. It was the beginning of the so-called Philadelphia School, Yes, there's a big gap of time, of course, between uh, this book of Venturi, Complexity and Contradiction of, I think I'm right, 61, and 1980 is 20 years, for God's sake. But uh, you can look at Kahn as being a kind of break with the culture of modernism, I think. But he's very much an architect of the New Deal. But uh, in 1975, there is this uh, bathhouse built in Trenton, New Jersey, which is already more formalist, you know, it has uh, pyramidal roofs, it's based on square plans with square columns, it's very geometric. You could argue it's almost a kind of return to uh, the very early modern movement in France, you know, where figures like Ledoux, for example, were were doing a kind of proto-modern, very highly geometrical architecture. So I think uh, Venturi is influenced by Kahn, He's not as formalistic as Kahn, but the kind of doubt about the modern project, both political, ideological, and aesthetic, is already on the move. Well, if you think of the Trenton Bathhouse being 75, it's another five years or seven years before, you know, the 1980 Venice Biennale, which is an entirely transatlantic Biennale, Americans and Europeans. And in fact, Robert Stern is the American commissioner of that Biennale, He joins forces with Paolo Portuguese to create this exhibition, which bears the title The End of Prohibition, The Presence of the Past, which is very much a kind of a sort of Venturi line in a way. I mean, the idea that uh, one should just indulge in pluralist, totally pluralist language and content for that matter. And I react against that, uh, as you probably know. I mean, I published this essay uh, towards a critical regionalism in 1983 which had been based on the idea the term critical regionalism had been coined in 1981 by the Greek architect and his wife, Alex Zonis. And it's an effort to kind of reground architecture with reference to regional culture. The Southern California had a regional modern culture, I mean, lasting in the end uh, right through to the 70s, 80s. I mean, because of Eames, etc., you can see Eames as a continuation of of Californian modernism. So the whole thing had a longer duration in California, uh, maybe even now to some extent. For the general public, people fell out of love with modernist houses in the 70s and didn't really start getting interested in them again until the 90s. And and, and ever since then, people have just fallen head over heels with modernist houses, with furniture, with fixtures and things like that in this wonderfully romantic way, which we love, because that's what we're all about. 
Do you think there's a time where people are going to yearn for postmodernism? Well, I mean, <laughs> we still live in a postmodern world, you know, so yearning for it comes back to a kind of ideological and political question because modernity as a sort of progressive idea, you know, is in a very bad shape, you could say. I mean, in a materialistic sense, because, you know, given climate change, etc., the modern project in a kind of progressive sense, as, as was thought of, let's say, in the time of the New Deal in the States, in the time of Mumford writing Techniques and Civilization, also in the 30s, and also, of course, in Europe and elsewhere for that matter, that idea of the continuation of the Western Enlightenment into a kind of modern realization of the, the idea of a liberative modernity, that's really the issue, I think. And uh, what we are faced with is a existential challenge, you can say, because climate change is so evidently with us more than ever every passing year. And our capacity to deal with it, I mean, the whole situation has changed. So from this point of view, I think we can say post-modernity in terms of it being a real condition is still very much with us, you know. It, it, ne it never left. No, it never left. In, <laughs> you know, in, in, independent of aesthetic. Yes. You know, so it's, it's very nice for a middle class and it's very positive for, for architects that, particularly in California, by the way, not so much in the East Coast, is, you know, very much in love with the, the modern project as it has manifested itself in the 30s and uh, right throughout in, in California, at least until the, yeah, I think until the 80s. Yeah, you know, that's very positive and, and it is still progressive. But of course, one needs the other, the other dimension in order to even survive, you know. And then we're in the midst of a political chaos in this country right now. So, uh, I mean, is this country governable at all, you know, from that point of view? What will this country do with regard to climate change? I mean, it's very unclear, all of this. Now, a couple of years ago, there was that initiative in the Trump administration to make federal buildings beautiful again, mm. which was the first kind of federally mandated design movement that I've heard of in, in decades. Was anything mm. like that going on earlier in the 50s or 60s? Well, you know, there, there's a big question, how do we define beautiful? You know, in the 60s, the federal government built in, um, in London, in Mayfair, you know, the American embassy by Aero Saarinen, which was, you know, the, the cutting edge, so to speak, of East Coast modernity at that time, and very monumental. It could be seen as part of the so-called new monumentality. And the American government, I think the federal government, was involved with this idea of the new monumentality, the kind of world order after the Second World War, you know. It took them a while to get around to it, but I think by the early 50s, that's a very um, well-developed idea. Now, whether that's beautiful or not is another matter. Well, the, the federal government was also using embassies and other buildings to export a symbol of America as a progressive place, as a place where the future was going to be coming, you know, and it was all going to be wonderful. We're going to have to all wear shades. Yeah, that's correct. And it was always given a monumental expression, you know. Even, let's say, the U.S. Embassy in Dublin was uh, sort of monumental. So it was always given a monumental expression. But... Uh, and I didn't know about the movement inside the Trump administration, as a matter of fact. So that's something I've learned from this uh, interview. Yes. Yeah, she'll have to look it up. It started a year or so before the end of that administration. It was put forward that all federal buildings had to be of the classic style that were over $50 million. Uh, and that they were basically eliminating modernist design as a style. Now, you see, they're returning to the, the Trump administration was trying to continue with the new monumentality of classic design, therefore, you know, etc. I mean, therefore, not modern, strictly speaking. Beautiful right. events of classic, you know. Yes. Now, of the younger architects these days, which ones are you on the lookout for? Which ones do you admire for their work? On the Californian stage, so to speak, I admire Stanley Seidefitz. And uh, on the East Coast, of course, I think one of the most extraordinary talented architects is, without question, Stephen Hull. I mean, neither of these people are that young. I mean, uh, trying to go younger, 
Well, uh, in, in Europe, of course, there is David Chipperfield and Tony Fretton, who are slightly younger. They're both British, but most of that's very interesting, by the way. Most of their, their best work has been done in Europe and not in Britain. Mm. In a way, uh, uh, the British government and also British society has not been uh, that favorable to the younger generation. I mean, before that, of course, there was the famous high tech movement. The late Richard Rogers, who recently died, and also, of course, the still extant uh, Renzo Piano, I mean, together, of course, made the Centre Pompidou in Paris in 1972. That's when they won the competition, anyway. And also, of course, Norman Foster. So the British high tech movement uh, was very successful and um, built extraordinary things. I think that moment is uh, over in a way. I mean, the ones who are still alive are fairly, uh, you know, venerable. And uh, their work doesn't have the power that it had when they were younger. I'm thinking, you know, of uh, Foster's uh, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, for example. Do you follow Björke Ingels at all? Yes, well, they are very uh, rhetorical, you know. They're very, yes, I mean, they're very successful. Yeah, they're very spectacular, you know. I I have my reservations about this work. Do I follow them? Well, I, I'm very aware of them. I think they're more coherent, by the way, than Herzog de Moron. Uh, they are very paradoxical figures. I think very successful, of course. Younger than them on, on the East Coast is Tom Pfeiffer. Sure. Who is a very up-and-coming up and interesting architect. He was with Richard Meyer for years. That's correct. Yes, I knew him. Well, I still do know him, of course. And um, <laughs> it's funny how you say that in past tense because he's he's really off the radar now. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, well, I think he still would recognize me, but uh, he's very definitely a promising architect and and represents on the East Coast. Maybe I don't know what age can he have? A uh, fifty something, fifty five. I don't know. Whereas Stephen Hall is, you know, in eighty years old. You know, so the scene is moving on. Yeah. Were there any architects that you really wanted to include in this book that you didn't? Oh, yes. Yeah, quite a lot. The introduction touches on a lot of these architects. For instance, there may be only achieve one building, but one really spectacular building, which is the Rome Railway Terminus in the late 50s. That is an extraordinary work. There is this uh, architect, Salvesberg, you know, the same generation, many of the works in the book are completed between 1930 mainly, or well, I suppose it begins in 26 and ends around 1970. Certainly during that same period there was Salvesburg in, in Switzerland. There were others, uh, also Greeks, very good Greek work in that period as well, which uh, I would like to have included, you know. Takas uh, Zenidos, did you know him? Yeah, I did. And he's there in the introduction, just one plan, and he, of course, was younger. I mean, he, he didn't emerge until after, he emerged in the 60s, basically. And he was a very promising, um, did you know him? He was a very promising architect. I, I did not. Oh, I, I discovered the, him after he died. Yeah, there's a brewery, a famous brewery in, in Athens. There's a famous company called Fix, makes beer. He did a great building for them. And also this school, I showed the plan of this school, which is still existing. Unbelievably radical building by him. There are other buildings, of course, but those are the two great works, I think. The book is called The Other Modern Movement, Architecture mm. 1920 to 1970. Kenneth, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. Yes. You're a young man with great promise. Oh, come on. <laughs> yes. I can't wait to see what you do next. Yeah, well, yeah, I know, I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> You know actress and singer Eileen Graff from the 90s TV show Mr. Belvedere, where she played the mom, Marsha Owens. From singing and acting as a teenager while attending Martin Van Buren High School in Queens, New York, she studied drama at Ithaca College, making her Broadway debut after graduation in the musical Promises, Promises, and later playing Sandy in the original Broadway production of Grease. Her biggest hit was the musical I Love My Wife, and after a huge run in Mr. Belvedere, she played Scott Porter's conniving, overprotective Southern mom on Heart of Dixie. Here's my conversation with Eileen Graff. Eileen, in looking on your career, the thing that just fascinates me about you, all the game shows. <laughs> 
evidently you're the partner to have on these game shows, right? <laughs> I loved doing game shows. Being on game shows was one of the best perks about being on a TV series when Mr. Belvedere was on the air because a lot of them had celebrity contestants or, you know, you would be the celebrity on the team. And I found out early on how much I loved playing games. I think the first one I did was Pyramid. That was with Dick Clark, right? When Dick Clark was doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yep. Dick Clark. And then later on, John Davidson. But it seemed that once you did Pyramid, all the other game shows said, well, if they're good at Pyramid, they're going to be good at all these other shows. And we still play. But there's a, a bunch of friends, uh, young guys that work in the game show industry now, and they figured out how to play all the games on the computer. And we have parties, what well, we used to anyway, before COVID, where we would play these really authentic versions of the game shows. And uh, it was just so much fun. I was looking it up and it seemed like there were about four or five people that were just on so many shows. Rita Moreno was famous for being on lots of game shows. Yeah, I never played with her. I never did. Boy, that would have been fun. Yeah, she, super <laughs> sharp, super sharp. Yeah. Tell me about your musical career. Well, music was always in our family. My father was a singer and a vocal arranger and a pianist and a accompanist and- um, In the Pied and, Pipers, uh, and my, right? He was in, there was a reboot of the Pipers. So he was not an original Piper with Frank Sinatra and that group. But in the 60s, there was a reboot of the Pipers, and he toured the country with them for years and years. Uh, but he was a very successful studio singer and vocal contractor in New York. And my mother was also a musician, taught piano and led choirs. So I grew up in the music business and in show business. So I started singing professionally, I guess, maybe 14 years old, 13, 14 on recording sessions and jingles and, and stuff like that. And it was the singing was the one thing that I always felt the most comfortable doing. Even when I was doing a lot of acting, I was always more comfortable, I guess, and felt most confident when I was singing. I looked up some of the shows that you were on early on, and they have great titles like a Barnaby Jones episode is called Child of Love, Child of Vengeance, Part Two. <laughs> well, I was also in Part One. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, that was my first guest appearance when we first moved to Los Angeles from New York. My husband, Ben Lanzaroni, is also, he's an ASCAP award-winning composer and an arranger and you name it, he does it. And we moved from New York to LA and that Barnaby Jones was my first TV job. and. I was really lucky because it was a great set. Everybody was really friendly. They were very welcoming. And, uh, and it was a two-parter. Wow. Yeah, I mean, right. Cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> this first song is called Unusual Way. What's that all about? Uh -huh. Well, Unusual Way is from the uh, musical Nine by Maury Yeston. And I always love this song. Nine is one of our very favorite musicals ever. And Ben and I were, you know, we're always looking for something to do. Let's record something. Let's do something. And we both said, gee, Unusual Way, in the show, it's done very legit. Um, the singer is a beautiful kind of not a real legit soprano, but it's a ballad and it's serious and it's very important. And we heard it and sort of said, gee, I think it would be nice if it was kind of lilting and a little sexy. So this arrangement is what Ben came up with. And I just love it. I think it's a whole other take on the song, which is which is what we like to do. And since you are a jazz aficionado, you know that in jazz, you take a tune and then you see what you can do with it. And that's kind of what Ben did with this one. And I love it. I think he did a great job with this arrangement. Here's Eileen with Unusual Way. Yes. 
I learned from your website, which was built by your daughter, is it Nika? Nika, yes. Nika, that you are a brilliant cook. What are some of your favorite dishes? Well, you know, I'm a Jewish girl who married an Italian. I mean, American, but, you know, from a a Sicilian background. And I just became really good at Italian food. So, you know, we have meatballs and spaghetti and baked ziti. And one of the things I love making is penne alla vodka, which is a beautiful pink. Oh, uh, one of my favorite sauce. dishes. Very creamy. Uh, very creamy, very luxurious, very bad for your cholesterol. <laughs> but it's it's just wonderful. But then on the other side, I love making homemade matzo ball soup and roast chicken and kugel and all the, the foods that I grew up with as well. That sounds delicious, actually. And yeah, one year, I don't remember what the occasion was, but we had for dinner, I guess we had company, probably my brothers, and we started out with matzo ball soup, and then we had lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. The United Nations should take you up on this uh-huh. menu. Right. This next song is How Do You Keep the Music Playing, which is really lovely. Thank you. And, and you've turned this into a charming ballad. Well, again, this is all Ben. We love, always loved this song, and we super fell in love with it hearing Tony Bennett sing it in a concert in Las Vegas. And, of course, now we are especially saluting the passing of the brilliant Marilyn Bergman, who, along with her husband, Alan, wrote the lyrics to this song, Michelle Legrand wrote the music. And um, Ben was fooling around with it, and he said, this is Rachmaninoff. It was inspired by the second movement of the second Rachmaninoff piano concerto, And this whole arrangement just sort of came out of my husband's uh, very fertile musical imagination. And I'm glad you like it because it's absolutely one of our favorite pieces to perform. And it's actually the one that people request the most that we do. Here's Eileen with How Do You Keep the Music Playing? Keep 
Since we know we're always changing, how can it be the same? And tell me how, year after year, you're sure your heart will fall apart each time you. Eileen, do you get to Palm Springs very much? That's kind of our second home base with all the modernist architecture there. Oh, you know, we have a lot of friends in Palm Springs. And more and more people my age are retiring to Palm Springs. People from the L.A. area, people from New York are coming out to Palm Springs. And we don't get there as much as we'd like to. But I had all kinds of plans of we had plans. We're going to visit this one. We're going to visit that one. And we have not been able to do a lot of visiting. But I agree. The architecture is just it's a blast from the past. And it shows how when things are really classically designed, they feel vital and important and contemporary, no matter when they were designed. Thank you so much, Ali. It's been really a pleasure talking with you. Thank you, George. It's been my pleasure completely. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. And by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. Okay, Tom, wrap us up. 
Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino runs the biggest, baddest bunch of rock and roll researchers the world has ever seen. Find out more at Carrie at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another footnoted, peer-reviewed, back-to-graduate-school edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Peter Frampton, we'd love to have you on the show, too. Yeah, 